All right, it's my pleasure to uh, kick off session four, which is on complex drug uh, formulations and dosage forms. In particular, we're talking about complex ophthalmic products. Uh, my talk, I'm going to focus in on the bioequivalence options or uh, available approaches for bioequivalence for complex ophthalmics. Then my colleague from OPQ will be talking a bit more about the testing approaches that are associated from drug product quality perspective. And then I think finally we'll have my colleague from PQMM will be speaking a bit more about how uh, quantitative methods and mod or, uh, PBPK modeling can be used to support bioequivalence approaches for these ophthalmic uh, products. So as I mentioned for my talk, I'll be covering over basically uh, regulatory background in which what types of bioequivalence options or approaches are uh, appropriate, specifically about the in vitro testing that may be done and when those can be considered and recommended for demonstrating bioequivalence of these drug products. I'll then talk a bit about the current thinking on the information to support the in vitro bioequivalence approach, specifically within a uh, pre-ANDA meeting or in the uh, ANDA submission. What type of information should be included from a sponsor to help support an in vitro option? And how then to reach out to the FDA and to respond about that back and forth to develop that approach. And finally, I'll be speaking briefly about and give a couple of examples about how the agency in general is trying to facilitate the approval and development of high quality generic drug products in the ophthalmic realm, and how the GADUFA research has been helping to do that from our perspective, as well as in the development of product specific guidances, and how those are aiming to also help that uh, development process back and forth with industry, and how industry can provide information back and forth, and it's a two way street on developing these different approaches. So, as many of us are already aware, that for simple uh, products or formulations, as are simple solutions, ophthalmic solutions or parental solutions, where the manufacturing conditions or processing steps probably do not affect the uh, final drug product, the in vivo bioavailability or bioequivalence of the drug product may be considered self-evident. That's just traditionally or colloquially known as an in vivo bio waiver. So for those simple solutions in which the manufacturing process isn't going to uh, affect the bioequivalence, then can approach an in vivo bioequivalence waiver for that. But for more complex drug products, where the manufacturing conditions or processing steps can affect potential uh, bio, in vivo bioavailability, bioequivalence may be demonstrated through several in vivo or in vitro methods, and the FDA may in general require in vivo and or in vivo testing to uh, uh, demonstrate the bioequivalence of those drug products. So for complex drug products, I think we've also referred back to the GADUFA 2 commitment letter, which describes those. For ophthalmics, those are generally suspensions, emulsions, and other formulations and when there's multiple sort of phases of drug, uh, phases of uh, matter in the system. <clears throat> so in terms for the uh, bioequivalence approaches for these drug products, the FDA has outlined the fact that you can do an in vivo PK, use a comparative uh, studies, which is a traditional approach that most people are probably commonly aware of. You can also potentially perform an in vivo pharmacodynamic study or comparative clinical endpoint studies. What I'm going to focus on specifically today is the, also the comparative in vitro studies. Now, each one of these options is generally an uh, agreeable or a general approach that can be demonstrated for bioequivalence, but each BE option has inherent benefits, risks, and limitations. In some instances, not all options may be appropriate for the proposed generic. Ultimately, the choice of a BE approach should provide an accurate, sensitive, and reproducible measured insurance bioequivalence. So as you're proposing, or as we're developing in vitro bioequivalence, or developing a bioequivalence approach, these types of considerations can be taken into consideration. So if you can demonstrate that, you, that your alternative method is an accurate, sensitive, and reproducible approach, it supports that approach for bioequivalence. <clears throat> So also, for ophthalmic topical drug products, generally you're supposed to be uh, formulated Q1 or qualitatively and quantitatively similar to the reference listed drug. Now for ophthalmic products, they may differ in the terms of preservative, buffer, tonicity, or thickening agent that's used under that CFR 314. But those differences cannot change or should not change the safety or efficacy of that drug product. We all know that changes in formulation may actually affect ocular bioavailability by, by altering the drug retention time or permeability of the ocular tissues. So I'm just giving a sort of a, a example here of the sort of body of literature that's already known and out there. 
with the no if you change a formulation perspective or change a uh, formulation component that you can actually change the bioavailability or the ocular distribution of the drug. So in this instance here, this is from a GADUFA research project that they've done through the University of East Finland. And this is in a rabbit study in which they changed the formulation viscosity as well as they also changed the particle size of the drug product. And the thing I want to highlight here is just those two parameters there in terms of the changes of formulation. As you can see, very, very different in terms of the amount of bioavailability in the ocular tissue, such as the cornea and also the aqueous humor. So as part of this, this, like I said, is just one component within the body of literature known out there that within non-Q1, Q2 products or even manufacturing differences, you can give rise to very different uh, bioavailability and non bioequivalent products. So <clears throat> the main aspect here is despite the similar allowance for parental products, um, that you can change those uh, uh, preservative buffer and other Q1, Q2 properties, for ophthalmic drug products, FDA has determined that as a scientific matter, any Q1 or Q2 differences from the RLD should be accompanied by an appropriate in vivo BE step. So if you're proposing a drug formulation that is not Q1, Q2 to the RLD, the FDA is going to strongly recommend that you do an in vivo BE study because those sort of changes within the formulation may give rise to changes in the bioequivalence and bioavailability. If it's Q1, Q2, you may be able to go to the next step of an in vitro approach. <coughs> so. Within the in vivo sort of studies and the um, in vivo uh, BE studies that are uh, possible for ocular um, drug products, one is a local uh, PK or an aqueous humor PK study. The aqueous PK study is typically for tra uh, transcorneal drug products in which the drug is at the site of action is near the aqueous humor. And with the challenges with this is this is a, you compare the drug concentration at the local site of action, which is in the aqueous humor. So there's obviously some associated difficulties and challenges with an aqueous PK study to demonstrate uh, bioequivalence because it requires a large number of subjects because each subject can only get a single sample of aqueous human PK as well as you have to then collate all those subjects together to give, ri to give a full PK profile. So this gives rise to the need for a large study population and statistical bootstrapping. <clears throat> for drug products in which what you can also do is a comparative clinical endpoint study. So the comparative clinical endpoint study compares a relative, uh, a, a known endpoint such as interocular pressure difference between both your test product and the reference product. The challenges obviously with a clinical endpoint study is the endpoint can be very semi-qualitative and it can be confounded by the patient disease state. So it's also often a poor discriminator between similar products that require similarly formulated drug products and requires large patient populations to accurate power that sort of study. So what I want to get to and focus on now is the actual in vitro BE approach and our current thinking on this approach. So this is a totality of evidence approach and simply it's to confirm that the physical chemical properties of two products are comparative such that they must have comparable in vivo bioavailability and bioequivalence and so it's BE can be considered self-evident. We kind of like to think of it as a fingerprint sort of analysis in which you take your reference product, you identify the critical quality attributes that could be affected by the manufacturing process or the different formulation components and be able to test those and compare those then to your proposed drug product. You get this sort of fingerprint analysis and then if you overlie each other, then we can consider those two drug products to be similar enough that they're bioequivalent. So within this aspect, the key components that can be uh, Analyzed obviously are things like viscosity, osmolarity, particle size, and as well as the IVRT, which Yan Wang talked about earlier in her uh, talk in the last session. <coughs> so there's also the additional considerations though. Is even if a product is formulated Q1, Q2, there could be those differences in the arrangement of the matter. That's that complexity of the system, such as the emulsion suspension, within that dosage form that can impact the product showed you that in the earlier sort of study in which they showed the different particle size actually affect the different bioavailability of the drug. So these differences in the range of matter can only arise from differences in the manufacturing process or excipient grades. So, so long as the product is formulated the same, has the exact same ingredients and the same sort of uh, quantities, the only thing that can differ between the generic product and the reference product is in the manufacturing processes. And the idea here is that these differences can be evaluated by those comparative physical chemical properties and tests. 
So the sameness and physical chemical characterization demonstrate the overall product sameness and thus equivalence. We like to kind of think of it locally as in terms of a similar to batch to batch uh, equivalence of a drug product. So now, what as an ANDA applicant or a, a proposed uh, um, uh, uh, sponsor, should you take into consideration when proposing an in vitro only approach? As I mentioned, the first thing that you'd want to do is establish Q1, Q2 sameness of your formulation. This can be done through reverse engineering of your drug product, and then you can send confirmation from the agency through a controlled correspondence. Then, after you've got a Q1, Q2 drug product, you should identify the product's critical quality attributes. These are the properties affected by the manufacturing process, the formulation steps, or the excipient greater sources that are used. As you go through, you should identify those, and you can do that through the reverse processing or through your manufacturing steps and say, these are the different sort of uh, properties that should be changed due to my manufacturing conditions. In addition, it's also strongly recommended that you can go through literature or provide internal studies on how these CQAs can affect the product quality and our overall bioavailability of that drug product. And finally, when presenting it either in your ANDA submission or a pre-ANDA meeting request, you should always provide comparative testing of your proposed generic and the RLD products CQAs. So the justification should also be provided for your analytical methods, why you chose the analytical method, why it's an appropriate analytical method to make that measurement for that drug product and under those conditions. You should also provide analytical method development to show that the method is actually appropriate for it. And then also your justification for sameness criteria. Now the FDA provides recommendations in the general thing on to what, how to assess those, but you should also be able to provide a comparative and an understanding of why you believe that your product is equivalent to that, or that, that critical quality attribute is equivalent to the RLD. So that might be through testing multiple lots of RLD, or it may necessarily be that you provide a, a high statistic sort of methodology for being able to compare those two. So those will then be evaluated as well as to uh, provide comment when you submit your ANDA or your pre-ANDA meeting request. So I'd like to finish up with kind of talking about what the aims of our, our agency as well as within our office in this ASBI uh, conference. And that's really to facilitate the approval and the development high quality generic drugs. And so with that, we have the GADUFA research program. That's where OGD funds conducts research to provide new tools to evaluate generic drug equivalents and for industry to help develop new generic drugs and products. So this is kind of a, a, a very exploratory as well as confirmatory sort of methodology so that agency and as well as industry can use these new tools and understanding to be able to develop these drug products and review and approve the drug products and have a better understanding and address some of the science gaps that are currently out there. So from OCA projects, we've funded a number of different research projects under the GADUFA um, umbrella. These include assessing product CQAs, looking at how different manufacturing techniques can affect the overall drug properties, as well as what properties are most impacted by the differences and changes within that manufacturing condition. Developing new IVRT methods, as I mentioned, Dan Wang spoke quite extensively about that, as well as the different methods that are being developed for this and their general purpose for evaluating the formulation components, as well as developing new analytical and statistic methods. And I think Meng uh, Hu spoke about that with the EMD methods. We're looking at ways in which you'd be able to address things that would necessarily not be able to be uh, looked at through other sort of traditional sort of statistical approaches. As well as we are ongoing projects in doing IVRDCs to get that correlation between the bio, the bio equivalence and bioavailability of the drug uh, property, and then ocular drug modeling and simulation. Andrew Babiskin will talk more about how that PD can modeling and ocular modeling is being able to help and advance this sort of field. And finally, we also develop a series of product-specific guidances, and this kind of outlines the agency's current thinking for demonstrating bioequivalence of this drug product. So these guidances are the only recommendations, and it's the thinking of the best methods. These are recommendations that guide generic drug Product development, and I say prescriptive, we're always open to alternative approaches, and that's through this pre-ANDA meeting request. So the alternative approaches can be things like if you want to propose an in vivo clinical study rather than an in vivo PDK, or let's say you want to provide the in vivo in vitro studies rather than an in vivo PDK sort of study. As I said, those would all then be submitted through a pre-ANDA meeting, provided that you demonstrate or provide enough justification as to why your proposed alternative approach sensitive, accurate, and reproducible, demonstrating bioequivalence. 
more information that you provide in that sort of realm, and it's a distance over what's currently being recommended, definitely supports your approach. So I'm going to finish up with an example of the in vitro biocoolants approach for one of uh, an complex ophthalmic suspension for low pretinol. It's a topically administered corticosteroid for the treatment of steroid responsive inflammatory ocular conditions. <clears throat> so from the formulation that's provided in the label, you can see that it's got the preservative, it's got a tonicity agent, and even a, a um, viscosity modifying agent. So the, bio, the uh, product specific guidance that we developed for that has two options for demonstrating bioequivalence. Developed an in vitro only approach or an in vivo B sort of study. You can perform either one of those studies to demonstrate bioequivalence. Each one has certain conditions or certain sort of uh, uh, ideas or recommendations that should be done to approach it in that way. For the in vitro only approach, the formulation considerations, and I've mentioned before, is this should be Q1, Q2 formulation. That way, only the differences between the two drug products are in your manufacturing or process. So the condition for an in vitro only approach for this drug product is that the formulation should be Q1, Q2 to the reference listed drug. And then you should identify and measure all the critical quality attributes and demonstrate that your product's critical quality attributes are similar to the reference listed drug. So in this instance, We've gone through and made recommendations based upon our understanding of what the critical attributes of this drug product should be, such as the surface tension and viscosity, and then those can be, be potential variability in the formulation and stabilizers, and the manufacturer's uh, process can change drug partition amounts. We ask you to also measure the amount of drug in each of the uh, phases of the formulation. In addition, one of the key sort of components that we ask to make a measurement of is the particle size distribution. Demonstrating that your size distribution has a very similar median and span as according to the population bioequivalence approach to demonstrate your uh, particles are similar, to, the drug particles are similar in your drug product as a reference listed drug. In addition, quite often for uh, in vitro BE approach, we also ask for an in vitro release test. And it's a performance test. It's not intended to simulate in vivo conditions. As Yan spoke about in her talk, is that it's supposed to demonstrate manufacturing effects or process conditions. And so you're really, a, it's a similar sort of a test similar to measure a critical quality attribute. You're measuring how well that drug is able to release and if it's affected by the manufacturing conditions. So you're assessing the formulation properties. But in addition, you may also approach this bioequivalence, or we also recommend that you can perform an in vivo aqueous humor PK study. So this formulation can, but does not need to be Q1, Q2. So if you decide that your formulation, you don't necessarily want to be the exact same preservative, tonicity agent, or other permissible exception excipient, we recommend that you go through the in vivo BE study. But in the same instance, too, it does not have to be a formulation difference. You could use a Q1, Q2 product and still recommend and go through an in vivo study for this. And alternatively, if you believe that there's an alternative clinical input that you would like to uh, pursue, that type of information could be put into a pre-NDA meeting with the type of endpoint that you'd like to pursue, as well as your justification as to why this is an appropriate way to demonstrate bioequivalence. So in summary, a BE approach must provide an accurate sense of reproducible measure to ensure bioequivalence, bioavailability and bioequivalence. <clears throat> with a Q1, Q2 formulation, an in vitro BE demonstration must, uh, product sameness must be considered provided information on the product CQAs, as well as your analytical methods and how they support BE. You should also provide data demonstrating analytical sensitivity to detect manufacturing or formulation-induced product differences, as well as information on how variability in the CQA can affect the in vivo bioavailability. Comparative data should always be provided on your proposed test product to the RLD product. And I think one of the big sort of take-homes for us is that one of our aims here is really facilitate the approval and development quality generic drugs, and so OGD funds these research as well as produces these product-specific guidances to help uh, facilitate that and interact with the uh, industry in a, a more appropriate way. So I've got a number of acknowledgments, both from our office, from uh, our office director, Robert Lineberger, as well as our team, and then also our colleagues in DQMM and OPQ for helping with the product quality, as well as from our policy department, and CDRH, who's obviously helping with some internal sort of research that is helping us to advance this sort of field. Ultimately, I'd like to thank everyone here for 